Hanks for the memory. For the Tin Lizzie, the Ford Model T. The Model A. The first V8. The Mercury. T-Bird. Classic Lincolns and all the others. It's been a long love affair with the most recognized symbol of the American way of life. The automobile. Let's take out the old family album. Reminisce about the past. Relive the legacy of the man who put the nation on wheels. Henry Ford. A legacy that began with the incredibly popular Ford Model T. The only automobile of its time that had the perfect combination. Power, lightness, and durability. All of this at a price the average family could afford. During the 1920s, it set an amazing record. 60% of all the cars on Earth were Model Ts. In 1924, the word affordable took on new meaning when the Model T Roadster sold for $260. Henry Ford, a living legend, created the Model T. It was 1908, five years after the Ford Motor Company opened its doors. The inventor ran through the alphabet until he struck gold with the letter T. And what a success. By 1913, to keep up with the ever-increasing demand, an inspired Henry Ford introduced the industry's first moving assembly line. By the 20s, he was turning out thousands of cars a day with an efficiency that astonished the world. A moving assembly line with every part made to fit perfectly, every man given a precise amount of time to do his job with no wasted motion, produced an economical yet desirable automobile. Every Model T was painted black. Every Model T looked exactly alike. Henry Ford demanded the strongest, most durable materials for these cars bearing his name. They had better steel than most automobiles. Here was an American car built with honesty and dedication, built to do the job. The Model T was tough as nails, a genuine folk legend. It would go anywhere. Its fame and glory came from true adventures and heroics. Where there weren't any roads, it would make its own. No challenge was too great. Up a high mountain pass through deep snow? Don't bet against it. The Model T was everything, the rugged and faithful. It was often called the Fliver or the old Tin Lizzie but always with affection. Its profile could be recognized a half mile away. The Tin Lizzie worked well in any situation, and it had character. At times, stubborn as an army mule. Speed burners on dirt tracks, an exciting combination. They added to the Model T legend as they challenged all comers. At places like Ascot and Langhorne, drivers Frank Lockhart, Eddie Meyer, Wilbur Shaw, Speed Hinckley, and others provided thrills and spills on many Saturday afternoons. Ford's lightweight spider-like chassis was a natural, with special wheels and bodies and engine equipment like Rajo and Frontenac, it completely dominated this kind of racing all through the 20s and 30s. The country was ready for the Model T. It took Americans out of their homes and put them on the roads. Virtually anyone who wanted a car could have one. If your friends didn't, you'd take them along. More than any car, Henry's Model T gave people independence and saved them time as they pursued the good life, pursued the American dream. It was some car preparing the foundation for everything we enjoy in today's automobiles. If it was up to Henry Ford, he'd have kept on making the Model T, the car he'd built to last forever. But the end was in sight, the end of an era. May 26, 1927, the automaker and his son Etzel were on hand to see the 15 million, the last Model T, roll off the assembly line. Times were changing, but Henry's old Tin Lizzie 
would be a tough act to follow. The Model T had become the national automobile. Now, Henry Ford had to create something even better. It took seven months of hard work and millions of dollars to retool before he had what he wanted. It was a new car, so completely new that the motor genius went back to the beginning of the alphabet. He would call it the Model A. The 1928 Model A was all Henry and Etzel Ford wanted it to be. Simple, yet everything new and up to date. From the chassis with a quick four-cylinder engine, four-wheel brakes and sliding gear transmission, to the body's more sporty lines. When it made its debut, it was easily the greatest new model introduction in automobile history. There hadn't been a new Ford in seven months. 10 million people turned out to see the Model A in the first day and a half. Hundreds of thousands of orders were taken. One of the first to take delivery of a new sedan model was cowboy humorist Will Rogers, a longtime Model T owner. Another early owner with a new roadster was world champion cowboy Bob Crosby. The new Model A Ford received so much national publicity that it was becoming very fashionable to be seen in one. Actress Dolores Del Rio got her chauffeur one of the new sport coupe models, one of the first in Hollywood. Women liked the car. It made them feel sporty. It had the kind of style and dash that fit the high-living American lifestyle in this era of ragtime jazz, the short skirt, and buying on time. The wealthy liked the Model A because it was the latest thing, the in thing, a decided change from their stuffy limousines. Demand for the Model A rode a crest of prosperity. By the end of 1930, four and a half million of these jaunty cars of many shapes and colors were sold. It wasn't until 1931, when the effects of increased competition from other makes and the crash on Wall Street sent sales plummeting. Henry Ford had predicted that the Model A was good for a 20-year run, just like his Model T. But pleasurable as the car was, events took its destiny out of his hands. Chevrolet, Henry's chief competitor, came out with a six-cylinder engine in 1929. Its popularity cut heavily into Model A sales. It forced the company to react, and Henry did. Mid-1931, Model A production was stopped. Ford introduced a new car powered by an engine that stunned the industry. It was America's first mass-produced, low-priced V8. Engineers said it couldn't be done. Ford engineers did it, cast an extremely complex V8 engine in a single piece. The company was back in the news with a revolutionary new engine. At 65 horsepower, it was not only more powerful and smoother than its competitor, the Chevy, but for about the same price, it took up no more space than the old four-cylinder. It was the birth of a legend, the first of the soon-to-be-famous Ford Flathead V8s, engines that would dominate America's fascination with fast cars for the next 22 years. Henry and Etzel Ford, father and son, watch as their first V8-powered car was assembled at Dearborn, Michigan. The date? March 9th, 1932. Henry created the new engine, Etzel the styling. Styling that resulted in this unforgettable car. Beautifully detailed from the classic radiator shell back 
It had rounded lines and a body slung low over a fast chassis. The 32 Ford had the perfect balance of proportion that would make it one of the most popular cars of all time. Offered with an optional Model B four-cylinder engine, the cars came in a wide choice of body styles, like this fashionable Victoria at $600, or the sporty all-weather Cabriolet at $610. Newsworthy and exciting, yes. But for the new Ford V8s, the timing couldn't have been worse. Jobs and money were scarce. It was 1932, the Great Depression. Cars were hard to sell. Crowds jammed the showrooms to see the new V8s, but few had the hard cash to buy one. The economy had hit bottom. By midsummer, sales were so slow dealers were holding open air shows, giving free rides in a bid to drum up sales. Unscientific, but entertaining, riders in an open Phaeton model are told, see how the V8 sticks to the road. But enough Americans did buy those first V8s. Henry Ford was on the right track with his new engine. The 32 Deluxe Coupe gave a hint of what lay ahead in styling. It was the first Ford with racy front opening doors. The 1933 V8 set the pattern for a complete styling change every two years throughout the 30s. And what a beauty. Winged front fenders, heart-shaped grill, rakish body lines, sheer poetry on wheels. It was state-of-the-art body design matched to the fastest, strongest, most flexible chassis in its class. The stunning new 1934 Ford was basically the same car, but with more horsepower and a few classy refinements. The depression was easing, and improved economy meant more people buying cars, more people traveling to places like the 1934 Chicago World's Fair where Ford offered free rides at its big exhibit. That June, the millionth V8 came off the assembly line. The hot new V8 was now the fastest thing on the road. No other car could keep up with it. And it wasn't unusual to see a hot-footed 34 owner challenge anyone and anything to a race even a motorcycle. 1933, the Elgin Road Race at a track in Illinois. Stripped down Ford Roadsters stunned national stock car racing when they easily took the first seven places to win. For its time, there was simply no car in America, big or small, that could challenge the Ford V8's power through the turns and speed down the straightaways. In race after race, on dirt tracks across America, the checkered flag belonged to the Ford V8. And they're off. 27 stock cars in a 250-mile drive. It's a sight to thrill any race fan. It's going to be an afternoon of terrific punishment for cars and crews such as few drivers can remember. 131 laps through dust, ruts, and wicked curves. And here's Herb Bomber in 22, a Chevrolet. There goes Bob Hahn in a Rockley. Look at number 10, Fred Frame, famous Ford, winner of the Elgin Road Race last fall. And there's Woody Woodford driving a Plymouth. Here comes number 7, driving like a madman to catch the leaders. Watch him skate around that curve. Boy, is he traveling. There he goes, number 7, overtaking 14. Now watch him on the right-hand turn. Boy, he almost lost his mechanic. Mile after mile, the boys push their cars recklessly in a dizzy duel for leadership. Watch for the blue flag. It means one more lap to go. Now it's the checkered flag to finish. And the winner is Stubble Field. 250 miles in four hours and 14 seconds. Gordon only a few seconds behind. Congratulations, Stubby. Ten forwards take the first ten places. What a race and what an afternoon. <laughs> It wasn't until 1935 that the fast and popular Ford V8s beat Chevrolet in the all-important sales race. These cars were longer and roomier. Ford sold a million that year, 
setting a record that would stand until 1950. The deluxe three-window coupe was just right for the sophisticated lady. The 1936 Ford introduced the smooth look. Americans were now part of a new modern culture that wanted cars with swifter lines and more Art Deco style. Competition was growing. Henry and Etzel Ford had to bring out something completely new every year. For 1937, it was an ultra-modern streamlined body and a smaller 60-horsepower V8 as an option to the regular 85. As for styling, the 37 Fords created a sensation with their new teardrop shape and sleek body lines flowing straight back from its hood louvers and futuristic V-shaped grille. For the first time on a Ford, the headlights were molded into its fenders. The hood now opened alligator style. Where the 1937 models had straight lines, the new deluxe 38 Fords had more curves. That year, at the annual Portland, Oregon Rose Festival Parade, the Queen and her escorts rode in a new Ford convertible sedan. The official cars of the festival were all white Fords. It would become an annual tradition. For 1939, the big news was that Ford finally got hydraulic brakes. Advertising became increasingly important. Ford made its first movie theater commercials in color. A stabilized ride, new cushion comfort, ease and quiet, new travel luxury in every Ford car. Get the feel of V8 performance. See your nearest Ford dealer for a ride in the quality car in the low price field. The Ford automobile was never better represented than in 1940. Beauty, quality, and ride came together in a car that would become one of America's all-time favorites. More than just good looks, it had new selling features. Among them were sealed beam headlights, and the gear shift lever was moved off the floor onto the steering column. The new business coupe had fold-down rear jump seats for extra passengers on short trips. It would be better known as the Opera Coupe. Though Ford was down to just one convertible model in 1940, it was a real beauty, with a back seat and a new automatic top. By the time the 1941 Fords came out, the nation was gearing for war. That may have influenced the car's front end design with its fighter plane type twin grill scoops. The economy was on the move. People were in the mood to buy the latest model. Who would guess that in December, all of this happy-go-lucky American craziness over cars would suddenly seem unimportant? While the Battle of the Pacific spread today over a 5,000-mile front, the United States formally declared war on the Empire of Japan. Following yesterday's shattering and unprovoked attack by the Japanese on Hawaii, the Philippines, Guam, Wake, and Midway, Congress met today at noon. By 4.15, the resolution declaring war was passed without debate and signed by the President, and the United States was at war. Ford's new models had already been introduced when the war broke out, but all civilian car production was stopped on February 10, 1942. Ford had a new mission. They would build military equipment for the Allies. In the service of America, Ford, the mass builder, has made thousands of jeeps. Long lines of tanks, the heavy M4, and tank destroyers, the hard-hitting and deadly M10 an armada of amphibian jeeps. Here comes one, and in she goes. Military trucks built by Ford were turned out by the thousands. 
Army air gliders built by Ford played an important role in the war, landing men and equipment behind enemy lines. The company created a miracle at its big Willow Run plant. It built giant B-24 bombers, like cars, on a moving assembly line. In 1944, B-24s were coming out of Willow Run at the incredible rate of one finished bomber every two hours. Henry's hard-working son, Etzel Ford, was devoted to the war effort. In 1943, at the age of 49, he fell sick and died. It was a terrible blow. Henry Ford was too old to run the business, so Etzel's oldest son, Henry Ford II, was brought home from the Navy. Two months before the surrender of Japan, Ford became the first U.S. automaker to get back into civilian car production. Here, young Henry drives the first 1946 Ford model off the line at Dearborn. The date, July 3rd, 1945. He presented the car to President Truman as testimony to America's ability to return quickly to peacetime production. Henry Ford died at the age of 83 in 1947. It was the end of the most remarkable chapter in the history of the automobile. Henry Ford II, his grandson, was running the company. He was to be severely tested. The war left the company in financial trouble. There hadn't been a new car design in seven years, and there was a desperate need to get something fresh on the market. The risks were high, but young Henry took them. He led a daring crash project to bring out a new car it had to be good. A gamble paid off. It proved to be the sensational 1949 Ford, the car credited with saving the company. It was like nothing Ford had ever built before. It was lower, shorter, narrower, yet still roomy. By now, people were buying cars by how they looked. Ford's new look for 49 projected clean lines leading to a bullet-shaped grille. Within the first three days of its introduction in June of 1948, 28 million curious Americans jammed showrooms to take a look at the 1949 Fords. Not since they brought out the Model A 20 years before had Ford seen anything like it. More than 100,000 cars were ordered on the first day alone. There had been years of rationing and shortages. Now. Americans needed many things, but nothing was in greater demand than cars. There was such a surge in buying that in 1949, the industry exceeded its 1929 all-time record. It produced more than five million automobiles. The boom was on. It was the beginning of a new prosperity and a new culture called automania. For the generation of the 50s, anything was possible and buying the latest convertible meant keeping up with the Joneses. The American dream had been realized. You could have anything you wanted if you could make the payment. By the summer of 1950, America was at war again, this time in Korea. But even the war didn't dampen enthusiasm for the new Fords, and another post-war sales record was set. A hot-selling new option first introduced by Ford on the 49 models was overdrive. You and your engine sit back and relax together for the smoothest ride you can imagine in the one fine car in its field. Now, suppose you need great acceleration, but fast. Tramp on it. A switch under the accelerator instantly puts your car into powerful, direct high gear. And when the need for acceleration is passed, just ease back on the gas. Overdrive takes over again. Life in the 50s, it had a lot going for it. In 1951, this new Ford V8 convertible sold fully loaded for about $2,000.
A gallon of gas cost 20 cents, and the fellow pumping it made about a dollar an hour. And some things were just taken for granted, like service. Anytime you stopped at a gas station, there was the usual free check under the hood, a complete polish of all the glass, and probably a check of the tire pressure all around. On the dirt track scene, hardtop racing was in. It was the latest craze in stock cars. And almost always they raced pre-war Ford V8s. For the dundest, dizziest, dustiest, and most dangerous race of them all, take a dirt track and fill it with stock cars held together by chicken wire and pure fool nerve. The result is a jalopy jam fest, a nightmare on wheels. Hot rodding, born in the 30s and 40s, reached its greatest popularity in the 50s, symbolized by the 32 Ford, the most popular car ever to hot rod. The craze swept high school campuses across the nation. Once again, it was the Fords that dominated the scene with their youthful styling and quick flathead V8 engines. Every good-sized high school had an auto shop. It was here that many future automobile careers got their start. Cars were hopped up, chopped, channeled, and raced at the drop of a wrench. This led to scheduled drag racing at old abandoned airstrips. Here, hot rodders would pioneer the speed and safety developments seen at these kinds of events today. Customizing. A more sophisticated form of hot rodding reached its zenith in the 50s. Today, it's considered a uniquely American art form. Ford sponsored a custom car show at Dearborn in 1956. These were among the entries. This 1950 Ford Club Coupe, and this chopped and section 48 Mercury. In 1953, Ford celebrated its 50th anniversary. The company had come a long way since the Model T. The gleam of new chrome, the sparkle of new paint, and that wonderful perfume that only comes from a new car. Yes, it's a familiar scene, one that's played every day all over America and we're all better off because of it. You see, that beautiful new car and the way Jim Johnson feels about it are the symbols of a constant desire for something newer and better that is typical of all the Johnson families across the nation. Nineteen fifty-four marked the end of the famous flathead V8 after twenty-two years was replaced by Ford's first overhead valve V8 engine, the Y-Block. There were other new Ford features this year. A man's work is from sun to sun, but a woman's work, well, that practically stops the second she slides behind the wheel of a Ford. With a touch and a button, she can raise or lower the seat or move it forward or backward automatically. She presses another button to raise or lower the windows. Now she moves the automatic lever to drive and enjoys automatic shifting no matter how many stops and starts she has to make. Americans were growing fond of European sports cars. And when Chevrolet's Corvette entered the two-seater market in 1953, Ford wasn't far behind. The beautiful new 1955 Ford Thunderbird was introduced to the press by company chairman Henry Ford II was September 1954. Base priced at $26.95 with a removable hardtop and quick 292 V8. It was an immediate smash hit. Outselling the sluggish Corvette in 1955, nearly 24 to 1. The sporty new T-Bird, as the public would call it, was more than good looking. It was fast. Daytona Speed Week, 1956. A specially tuned T-Bird, driven by Chuck Day, won the standing mile against every other make entered in the production sports car class. Last and fastest of the Thunderbird two-seaters was the Classy 57 model, available with an optional supercharger 
it made the fastest flying mile of any 1957 car at Daytona. Successful as these popular cars were in their first three years, Ford marketing surveys showed that, given a choice, if it had a back seat, more people would buy it. Out of this came the new four-passenger Thunderbird for 1958. Ford had done its homework. Sales of the new square-style T-Birds, which came now as a fixed hardtop or convertible, nearly doubled the first year, tripled the next. The Thunderbird's future was sealed. It was now a family luxury sports car. 1961, the projectile look with full-length body sculpturing. 1962 produced a dream variation of the regular convertible in the form of the racy sports roadster. It featured wire wheels and a tonneau that transformed it neatly from four seats to two. Introducing a new Thunderbird. So different, so beautifully different. In 1964, another more aerodynamic series was unveiled, ending in 1966, the year the last Thunderbird convertible was offered. From now on, the preferred T-Bird would be a sporty hardtop. Meanwhile, back in 1955, the Ford line for that year got a fresh new look. Glitz and glamour were in. The car's most striking feature was the full-length body molding that dipped at the door to divide some splashy new two-tone color combinations. Top of the line was the new Fairlane, named after Henry Ford's home in Dearborn. Pictured here as a backdrop to a 1956 two-door Victoria model. The colorful 56 Fords were a little changed from the 55s except for trim and some new safety features. In 1957, the latest rage was tail fins. That year, Fords were modest compared to others. Considering the period, a time of silly extravagance, the car's styling was fairly clean and simple. The most talked about car in 1957 was the new Ford Skyliner. Just about 50 seconds, less than a minute to change from a hard top to an open air car. The world's first and only true hard top convertible. That's the Fairlane 500 hideaway hard top. In late 1955, Ford Motor Company offered one of the most stunning cars of the decade, the top of the Lincoln line, a new and very limited production Continental Mark II. Virtually handmade, elegantly styled, with some of the purest, understated lines to come out of Detroit. It was America's longest, and at $10,000, its most expensive car. The Lincoln nameplate joined the company in 1922. That year, Henry Ford bought the failing Lincoln Motor Company. His young son, Edsel, was given an assignment. Make it into one of the great names in luxury cars. Edsel had a talented eye for styling, and it showed in the handsome cars that followed. By the end of the 1920s, the ritzy Lincolns were not only a favorite of high society, but fast enough that Chicago's police department bought a fleet of them to go after Al Capone. Another Lincoln fan, Detroit's police chief, carried out his duties during the Depression in his big 1932 staff car. That same year, the pace car for the Indy 500 race was one of the beautiful new Roadster models. The driver was Etzel Ford. The 30s were the all-time classic years of the automobile for grand scale, 
style and embellishment. There was a national depression. Competition was keen. Yet, it was during this remarkable time that Lincoln would produce some of the most beautifully designed and exquisitely built cars ever made in America. For the middle-priced buyer, there was also the ultra-streamlined new Lincoln Zephyr V12, introduced in 1936, a car way ahead of its time in automotive design. Edsel Ford and his Lincoln designers created a car that is considered one of the true milestones in automotive design. The year was 1940. The car was the Continental. That first Continental, those that follow, won many fans. The series ended in 1948. By the early 1950s, most of these beautiful cars were in the hands of admiring Continental Club members. Ford undertook a major redesign of all its cars in 1949. The Lincolns got an all-new look, a new V8 engine, and a plush new ride. In the 1950s, buyers could choose between several luxurious models. Among them, the Capri and the larger Lincoln Cosmopolitan. The spiffy Lincoln Premier made its debut in 1956. The car was offered in a glamorous choice of colors. It won the Industrial Designers Institute Award that year for excellence in automotive design. Mercury, another popular nameplate. It's played an important role on the American automotive scene. Placed in the middle price bracket, it was introduced in 1939, designed to compete with GM's Oldsmobile and Pontiac. The Mercury line proved to be one of Ford's most successful car launches, a winner right from the start. It appealed mostly to a rising new American middle class, offering the right combination of power, comfort, and sporty good looks. The new Mercury for 1949 continued its winning ways with a low silhouette and shapely lines. Few cars in the 50s were more cool to be seen in on the cruising scene than the 49 to 51 Mercs. The next generation of Mercuries splashed onto the automotive scene. There was more chrome, glamour, flashier colors. Two tones with matching interiors. These were the best sellers. American women love their cars. And Mercury continues year after year as the one car that has always had an enduring feminine appeal. An appeal that keeps them coming back. You just can't beat a 58 Ford. Try one out soon at your Ford dealer's. Tell them old Ern sent you in. Thank you. The 50s gave us some of our most unforgettable cars. Cars that would come to symbolize an era of bold, glittering excess. The 60s paid homage to youth and all-out performance. Amid the enchanting fountains of Villa d'Este, Ford presents its newest top-down creation, the 1961 Sunliner, a new classic among convertibles. Introducing the first Falcon V8, the sprightly Falcon Sprint, fresh from its conquest of the Monte Carlo Rally. Its new scat-back roofline and hardtop styling are now offered in other Falcon models, too. In the Sprint, you also get bucket seats, a console, a new wood-like steering wheel, and a tachometer. And now listen to this. The V8 engine that's standard in the Sprint is now available in every Falcon. It's the world's most fun-to-drive compact, the 63-and-a-half Falcon Sprint.
The American auto industry produced a generation of exciting cars in the 60s, but nothing compared to the Ford Mustang. No other car even came close to challenge its success. Introduced in April 1964, it would become the car of the decade, starting the pony car craze. The Ford Mustang appealed to anyone with a youthful spirit and a sense of adventure. For Detroit, the Mustang was a completely new concept. It combined sports car size and looks with hot performance, low price, and a back seat. All this for the choice of so many options, a buyer could just about order one tailor-made. The cars were an American phenomenon, a sensation. Ford couldn't build them fast enough. Later in the year, a racy fastback 2 plus 2 model was offered with additional performance options that made the cars even more desirable. The booming youth market had arrived. Ford read the trend correctly. By the time the snappy 66 models came out with exciting options like the new GT package, there were more than 700,000 on the road. 1967 saw the launch of a slightly larger Mustang series. This gave the car a smoother ride and wider appeal. Though it took the edge off the buying stampede, the cars were still the most popular by far in the pony market they created. The milestone two millionth Mustang, the Candy Apple Red GT, came off the line in 1969. All-out performance was king in the marketplace, and the advertising theme that year said it all. It's the going thing. By now, Ford speed merchants had put a thundering new American legend on the road. Mach 1, special sports performance, sports roof, Mustang. An eight so hot performing, it comes with its own poke through air cleaner that jumps when the engine growls. Mustang, Mach 1. Color this one hot. There would be other fast and famous Mustangs, like the 1969 Shelby GT500 Fastback, one of a series of high-performance cars built jointly by Ford and racing great Carroll Shelby. Interest in performance cars had become a national craze. It grew in direct proportion to the booming 60s youth market. Ford Motor Company was into racing in 1963. It moved into high gear in 64 when it offered ground-shaking new 427 Mercury Comets and Ford Thunderbolts to top drivers in national drag racing. The investment in performance really paid off. When Gas Ronda took the national top stock championship in 1964 with his hot 427 Ford Thunderbolt, race fans wanted one just like it. This is Van Patrick at Riverside, California, home of the rugged Riverside International Raceway, where the first major race of 1964 was held Sunday, January 19th. Stock car racing was hotter than ever, and Ford was back in a big way, sponsoring some of the top race teams and drivers with a new high-performance 427 Ford Galaxy. Ford's Lincoln Mercury division sponsored its own Mercury race teams. They chalked up some impressive wins. In 1968, 
Cale Yarbrough, driving a cyclone, won the 500-mile races at Daytona, Darlington, and Atlanta. 1966, Ford's most dramatic effort on the track. The company built the ultimate race machine, the GT40, to enter Europe's most prestigious race, the 24 Hours of Le Mans. seven-liter GT40s ran away with everything. They beat the favored Ferraris, beat them badly, and went on to win easily one, two, and three. It was a big win for Ford, a big win for America. The next year, in 1967, the cars returned to repeat their victory. Boss 302, Mach 1, 428 CJ, four on the floor, high performance, all part of a new language in the 60s. These were exciting times to be young in America and into cars. If you liked what you saw on the track, your Ford or Mercury dealer had just what you wanted for the street. In the new language, it would be called the muscle car. For the first time, a Fairlane convertible GT model, packing a 389 cubic inch V8. Deep down, still Fairlane rugged, Fairlane reliable. But what a beautiful difference for 66. The seven liter hardtop with a standard 428 cubic inch V8. It's the Mercury Cougar 7-liter GTE with its own distinctive blackout grille, specially styled rear end, and a two-tone side treatment. Underneath the twin air-scooped hood is 7 liters of punching power. Torino Convertible GT Style. GT Flare Open Air Style with new evidence of how Torino continues to pace its field. I think you will agree that we have good cause for satisfaction with the company's recent performance. The results for 1970 reflected in large part your management's strenuous efforts in the first quarter of this year. An inspiring address is given by Mr. Edsel Ford, president of the Ford Motor Company. This company has had a great deal of experience in the course of its 33 years of manufacturing. And one thing it has learned is that the principles on which it is founded are pretty sound and they wear well in all sorts of times. Your job is one of which you may well be proud. And so Henry Ford has left an incomparable legacy in his cars. Cars that put a nation and the world on wheels ever-changing in the transformation from the old faithful Tin Lizzie to the cars that through the years have come to symbolize our love affair with the automobile. Thanks, Mr. Ford. Thanks for the memory, the fun, the romance, and the nostalgia. Thanks for all those wonderful cars that have been so much a part of the American dream. Harry, let's do a song. Sweetheart, if you should stray a million miles away, I'll always be in love with you. And though you find more bliss in someone else's kiss I'll always be in love with you I can't do any more 
I've tried so hard to please Let me thank you for Such tender memories I wish you happiness As for me, sweetheart, I guess I'll always be in love with you.